So I actually had a chance to look back at some of the conversations we had over the year. The last one we had before the pandemic shut everything down, it was, it was in Texas. This is like five years ago. We started talking about how you're looking at data centers and finding the right data centers and how to look at conserving power yeah. and finding ways. And this was like well before ChatGPT oh, and yeah. all the Gen AI stuff. You were already focused on that. And one of the reasons that you were talking about it was you were always looking for ways to you know, make sure you weren't a costly input to customers. And you were already talking about power being one of those things. And now, fast forward to last week, you announced you were chief scientist. I, I, I wasn't really surprised because you were already t- you didn't talk about this. So why now did it come up that you wanted to be known as a chief scientist? Well, first of all, step back. I've always focused on efficiency. That whatever we do, we have to we we owe to the planet too to be efficient. You know, not throw energy away, all that. And uh, that's why data centers, how code runs, all that. And now, particularly in the ZI era, how you heard about the complete new power plants, nuclear power plants, all the getting built just to feed the AI monster, if you will. And you have to do this better, right? And there is a lot of low-hanging fruit. You know, the way software runs today is quite inefficient. There's layers and layers and layers of craft that's accumulated. So I've been thinking about these and I've made some progress, you know, on the, on the edges. But I decided to plunge in full time and get get this done. I mean, this will help bo- both of our efficient computing. That's one goal. Easier computing, easier for programmers, all that. The programmer productivity aspect. It turns out there isn't a trade-off between a programmer productivity, a runtime efficiency, energy efficiency, all these goals. There is kind of an aesthetic way of approaching it that you can achieve all of them well. And that's the quest I'm on, and uh, now is the time because now this is our AD moment after Deep Seeks. Yeah, they, uh, things change. <laughs> These change really quick over the last couple of exactly. weeks. So, is it? I'm I'm guessing it makes it really simpler and easier for you to kind of switch from CEO to chief scientist because you have so many people that have been here for so long. Yeah. And what role does that play in that trust factor play and allow you to do this and make sure everything else is okay? Uh, it's a lot. I mean, you look at, for example, Tony, our co-founder. Now he's our CEO of our U.S. operation. We've got Sailish, who's our CEO, global CEO. He has been, what, nearly 28, now almost 30 years with us. So it's, you know, these people know their stuff. And they know how to run the business. And they've been running the business in many ways because you know where I sit, I'm in a remote rural area. So, and so that's, I felt particularly this moment and it is also the consensus among everyone. It is, it's like, you know, I'm kind of, a, I'm relaying what other people also felt that now is the time to, uh, and also the company should think long term. No, nobody lives forever, right? So it's not good to just hold on to something forever. So I think it's time to step aside, make a transition. At the same time, I want to pursue this passion of efficient computing. And so I'll be very much focused on technology. I get much more time now to do it. That's what I really like about it. <laughs> We're at 2025. Zoho started when? 96, approximately. Yeah. So we're coming up on 30 years. Next year, this time when we're talking, it's going to be 30 years. What does that mean to you? Zoho, 30 years in. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been a long, long journey. We've, we've seen ups, downs, two, three big ups, big downs, and of course. And we are now coming up on the next big bubble, the AI bubble, all that. Uh, the company has stayed relevant. That's what is still we are relevant to whatever the customers need today. That's the, I think, the most, you know, I, I take satisfaction that we have stayed relevant. We are able to reinvent ourselves. And I just hope that the next reinvention also we can do this because every time it's always a risk, right? Yeah. You know, can we navigate this whole AI landscape? I'm more confident now than, say, I was a year ago. Okay. Right? What, why? Why? What happened there? Well, we kind of, you know, my presentation laid out the roadmap, all of that. We kind of get what's this good at all that. Because there's sometimes people make this breezy prediction, 
all the relational database, everything is gone. And SaaS is dead because all of that stuff will be ingested into LLMs. I don't think so. <laughs> right? Yes, the software landscape is going to change for a different reason. And the reason is not because the data got ingested into LLMs, but because the code part of it becomes easier, simpler, programmer productivity jumps tenfold, hundredfold. And when productivity in a critical sector goes up, the fruits of that are widely distributed throughout the economy, not necessarily accruing to that sector. That's true for farmers, that's true for weavers, all of that. And so now we have more food than we can, you know, we need, and we have more clothes than we need. But the people growing the food, people who are producing the clothes are not very wealthy. Right. So it's the same thing could happen to we have more software than we ever need. But maybe the people producing the software, that's like people like us, may not be, you know, in very good economic shape. That transformation, if that's going to come, then we have to figure out how a company like us survive, navigate this transition.